So we got this, you guys hear me? All right. So first of all, thank you for coming this morning. Um, this is sponsored by Polar. Uh, that being said, just to give you guys a heads up, not everything we're gonna be talking about is Polar. Okay, so we're really gonna focus on uh, the application of different monitoring techniques, whether they work, whether they don't, and really what the outcomes are that are associated with that, really focusing on both facilitating recovery and improving performance. Get a couple things out of the way. Uh, Dave DeFabio is employed by Polar, I am not. Uh, however, I'm on the Medical and Scientific Advisory Board for Quest Diagnostics, uh, so I will be talking about some of the biomarker work we do as well. All right, so <clears throat> if you have any questions after this as well, if we run out of time, Dave will be at the Polar booth in the vendor area where you can talk to him, and I'll be floating around uh, throughout the week. So to give you an outline in terms of where we're going to try to go with this, what are we trying to get across? Bottom line is, we're going to try to give you an overview of what training stress and training response really entail. All right, and then really how technology can help us both quantify and monitor both of these outcomes and variables. What we're really gonna try to focus on though is actionable data, all right? And there's gonna be a, a particular emphasis on this later on when we talk about what do you do about this, all right? Because um, there's a lot of technology out there. I'll tell you right now, not all of it's very useful. Okay, so, and I think people think it's a lot more useful than it is, so they try to use everything, and we'll talk about what does and doesn't really go together. We'll define and apply training loads, how to monitor both acute and chronic load and stress, and then really ultimately what our implications are for recovery, injury risk, and performance. And that's really what we're trying to get at in terms of keeping the athletes on the field and having some positive outcomes that go along with it. And if we have time, question, and answer. Now, to get us started, um, if you're a strength and conditioning coach, if you're working with athletes and you're trying to optimize performance, obviously we focus on things like power, strength, different corrective exercises, mobility, as well as energy specific system type of development. All right, and really what we're trying to do is we're trying to impact their fitness level and get them to a point where we can get a little bit more out of this. As we raise that fitness level, what we're gonna try to do is apply both volume and intensity to get a training load. All right, and now obviously frequency is gonna play a role in here too. All right, but adding a third arrow was too complicated for me on this slide, so I just left it at this. So anyway, we've got intensity and volume getting at training. Well, this is your basic compensation and super compensation model. What we're gonna to try to do is as you apply the training stress, what we're gonna to try to do is develop a response. From that response, ultimately you'll see an initial decrease in performance, right? You just trained them, they're fatigued, what are we gonna do? Well, that's where we get to the next phase. Now at the next phase, what we're trying to ultimately do is apply both physiological and mechanical recovery. Now, and really the recovery part is something that's so commonly ignored or forgotten about or sort of assumed. So we got these great ways to measure training stress but what do we do about recovery? Because if we do this right, what we're trying to do is as the athlete recovers, we're trying to bring them up to this level where they're rebounding. And really, as we apply these different methods to try to improve recovery, whether it's nutrition, whether it's hydration, sleep, all right, I threw an ice bath in here even though I don't really think it works. All right, because it's a good picture. All right, but then on top of that, you've got massage therapy, things like that. All of these things are our aspects that athletes will try to use to recover. And so what we're trying to do is take that training load and make it work for us. All right, and that's where we get this response. Now, if we do this right, what we're ultimately gonna do is we're hoping to rebound beyond this and promote adaptation. All right, there's your basic model of supercompensation. So when we start to look at all these things, the part we have to realize is that realistically, we can monitor a ton of different stressors that contribute to physical performance in sport. All of our different applications, the way we're developing power and strength, the way we're trying to recover, but what we're gonna to try to get out a little bit today is just because we can doesn't mean we should. All right, and the other part of it too is just because we can doesn't mean we're doing it right. All right, so what we'll try to get to today is how we can use this for better action and application. All right, and not get caught up in all the little minutia when all is said and done. All right, and really trying to get us moving forward so that we use technology for us, not just because we can use technology. And there's a big difference. These are all tools that you can ultimately apply. All right, so <laughs> the other question that we're gonna try to answer today, and I'll spend a lot more time on this later, okay, is what about monitoring the cumulative stress of the sport and of life? Because a lot of the technology that we use is based on training load. 
Well, here's the thing. If you're practicing two hours a day and that's what I'm monitoring, I got 22 other hours I have to account for. I, and ultimately that part of it becomes a really critical question for us. So what does life throw at us? I work with college athletes as well as professional athletes. All right, so at Rutgers, we work very closely. I'll talk a lot about what we do with the women's soccer team in particular. Fantastic program, okay? They're highly ranked, they do well. But what we're starting to get at are the stresses of college life too, and travel. Okay, all the things that some of our overreaching studies have not done. They're very contrived, laboratory-based studies. You start to throw in two road games at Nebraska or Penn State or Ohio State or Michigan, and now you're looking at this, and then you're dealing with them not eating right, not sleeping enough because they're studying for exams. You can't mimic that in a lab. We need a real-world setting to do that. And that's what we're starting to get at. So that life stress becomes a really important consideration for us. And, and what we've worked on is how do we monitor this? But here's the thing. Before we ever get to that, you have to form a foundation. You have to have a good system in place to monitor the most monitorable stuff. I'm totally sure I just made up a word. But ultimately, if we can get at that, all right, and we can monitor and build a foundation, the other stuff can add on. It's like baking a cake. You gotta have the cake first before you put on the icing and the sprinkles. All right, so what we're gonna try to develop and what Dave's gonna focus on next is really the role of wearables in all this to get us started to go in the right direction. So without further ado, Dave Fabio from Polar. Thanks, guys. Thank you for being here. I know there's a million other things that you could be doing right now, so really appreciate it. I'm here, honored to be speaking with Dr. Arndt, and I know I'm jumping in front of the Dr. Arndt train right now, so I'm going to try not to get run over. Uh, I'm going to try to hold my own here. I do work for Polar, so I am going to talk to you about the technology a little bit, but I hope to do it from a very practical sense. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Arndt, and he's going to talk to you about the real-life results that he's getting with his program. So I figured I'd start here, right? Where's a wearable? Seems like a pretty obvious thing to me anyway, but I've been in this world for a while now. I'm a little surprised how many questions we get at Polar about, okay, well, how does this work? What do I wear? Wait, where does, where does this go? I put it on the bike. I put it on the athlete. So I figured touch on that a little bit. Basically, what you're just dealing with ultimately is either a single sensor or a combination of sensors, typically a data transmitter and a receiver, that can be worn traditionally. I think most people are familiar with this sort of image, worn around the torso on the athlete for data transmission. But then that data needs to get sent somewhere, usually to a training computer, either a wrist unit, like I'm wearing here, or maybe a monitor or training computer on the bike. Uh, now, more recently, with the advent of all the mobile devices and Bluetooth signals, we could have data beamed directly to a phone or to an iPad, where coaching staff can view an entire team's worth of data live during a practice, during a game. That's kind of what you see here. Um, this particular app, you can monitor up to 60 athletes at a given time. Uh, and then, you know, I did mention cycling. So there's all kinds of uh, sensors to pick up cadence, uh, RPMs, peak torque, wattage. Uh, you know, we, we have these pedals that can be put onto the bike for that sort of data as well. So you're getting some sort of either biomechanical or biometric feedback. So we have these cool toys, cool training tools that we can play with and implement it just like any other training tool, right? Whether it's a kettlebell, a dumbbell, a sandbag, whatever, the results that you get with those training tools are going to depend highly on the practitioner and the way that it's implemented. and the end, the end user, basically, the client, the athlete. So same idea here. The, these, these wearable technologies are just a training tool to help you along the way. So we're ultimately hoping to get better understanding of our coaching. And anybody in this room that's about my age might know who that character is. Um, while he may have some redeeming qualities, he strikes me as somebody that sorry, that was a little out of order, might still be using the puke index as a way to gauge proper training volume and intensity. Right or wrong, I'm not here to say whether that's right or wrong, but I think there's probably more practical ways where we can get a better understanding of the athlete. And ultimately, I think this is my favorite part, the technology is going to allow you to see things that the naked coach's eye cannot see. So with that in mind, 
that's a photo and motorsports, I know very little about motorsports. When I, so when I first saw some of these numbers that I'm gonna show you guys, I was shocked. Couldn't believe what I was seeing. I know it's kind of hard to see back there, but that's Ken Roxon, a champion uh, motocross athlete. He's on his bike doing seemingly a very stationary, non-dynamic thing, and his heart rate's at 190 beats per minute. I wouldn't have guessed that sitting on a bike. I'm like, I think probably the general public that says, ah, they're not athletes, the machine's doing most of the work. <laughs> oh, he's doing some work somewhere. That's not the case, right? So it's not just the machine. So very similar, here's Kevin Harvick, champion NASCAR racer, beginning of a race, He's got his monitor on, he's at 60 beats per minute. <laughs> During the course of a race, some very high heart rate stuff going on. What you're looking at there is, that's his dashboard cam, he's looking at the number 42 car, starting to lose control, his heart rate goes all the way up to 180. I wish we had a monitor on the 42 car and see what his heart rate was at that given moment. But here's what really hit me. Depending on the race, you're talking two, three hours, he's averaging 165 beats per minute. What other type of sports or athletes does that make you think of? There's some ultra endurance stuff going on right there. Um, so maybe we need to consider that in our training programs. If I had a client like that come to me and I knew nothing about the sport, what am I gonna, what am I gonna do? So I think that's where, again, the technology can help us uncover some things. And then one last thing, not to belabor the point, but here, slightly different side of the fence. This is the pit crew, and I believe that's the crew chief right there, standing on the retaining wall. Again, doing something very stationary, standing. But he's at 160 beats per minute, which corresponds to 80% of heart rate max. What he heard in the headphones was that the car is about to pit in, about to pull into the pit. Jumped up on the wall, he's waiting for the car. Before he's done a bulk of his work, <laughs> he's already up in a nice, potentially anaerobic zone if that, if that is a such thing, but he's probably somewhere around either his lactate threshold, his ventilatory threshold, something we could figure out with further testing. Which kind of brings us to the next point. So we're hopefully gonna use this technology to define things, like Dr. Arndt was saying, define things outside of just the weight room. We've had, we have our systems in the weight room for tracking things like volume and intensity, um, but what are we doing outside of the training facility? So we have devices that did battery die on this? That can look at things that we would normally classify as volume, simple things, time, right? Distance covered, total number of reps from an intensity standpoint, heart rate, speed, acceleration. There's other things, that's obviously not an inclusive list there, 100% inclusive. But then we could also look at those things and dive a little deeper and say, all right, what other definitions can we come up with? Maybe we can look at things like heart rate and that we would classify as physiological stress or internal load, or as Chris West from UConn and many other coaches like to say, you know what, that's effort. That's effort level, internal effort. The question is at a given effort level, how much work can we produce? So maybe we start looking at these other things like speed, acceleration, we'll start to define that as mechanical stress or external load or work. But the reason why I really like this is because if we're looking at effort versus work, what are we talking about? We're talking about an athlete's efficiency, ultimately their fitness level, right? What do we hope with a fit, healthy athlete? We hope that they can produce a lot of external work, however we're gonna define a lot, but a lot of external work at a very low effort. So maybe their heart rate response is fairly mild. Um, maybe their caloric expenditure is fairly mild while they're still producing high speeds, high total number of sprints, that sort of thing. So we can look at this stuff. We can look at some of the metrics I already mentioned. We can look at heart rate variability. We can look at sleep. What we need to keep in mind, and Dr. Arn, I know is gonna talk about this later, is we wanna avoid data diarrhea. So we've got this nice fancy tool that we invested money in, but now what are we gonna do with the numbers? Data, that's data right there, it's just numbers. And I know that's kind of hard to see, but I'll tell you what it is. You're looking at heart rate, speed, distance, acceleration, running cadence, sampled 10 times per second, so at 10 hertz. So imagine a two hour long game, training session, whatever, at 10 hertz. That would be pages and pages and pages of data. What are you gonna do with the numbers? So these next two slides, are about putting things in context. I think first it's important to remember that 
with these monitoring systems, where does it fall in? Data collection is just part of the process. Why collect data if you're not going to do anything with it? So ultimately, what are we trying to do? Well, we're starting off with our periodized plan, right? And then what do we do after it? We put it into motion and do we just keep our fingers crossed that it's working or do we want to actually make sure it's working? So we do maybe some blood marker testing. We, we get some other monitoring systems after we've put, or I'm sorry, before we've put the planning, uh, the training plan into motion, hopefully we've, we're doing some baseline testing at the beginning of the season and then we're following up and doing tests in the middle of the season, at the end of the season, and we're looking at our data that we're collecting with our monitoring system. We're running reports for sports medicine, strength conditioning, and the coaching staff to look at so that we can look at trends over time and say, are we on track, are we off track, do we need to make some adjustments? So you're evaluating, and then you just repeat the process, right? So it's just all part of the process. The data by itself, the numbers, you're not gonna find any answers in just the numbers. Hopefully what it ultimately does is we can start to put the numbers into context so that even if we don't have a concrete answer, we can start to ask more intelligent questions. So, you know, we're trying to take that data, those numbers, and develop some information off of it. And then with that information, we're going to develop some knowledge. And then ultimately, what we gain, what we hope to gain is wisdom. What do we do with that wisdom? We make decisions about our training plan. Um, maybe as some teams have gotten to the point where they're actually using the data to make in-game decisions, substitution pattern decisions. And that kind of takes me to this next slide here. So there's maybe only a handful of teams that have gotten this far where they have two, three seasons worth of data where they trust the data enough along with their intuition where they're looking at things like the distance covered in high, high speed zones, uh, the time covered in uh, high heart rate zones, and looking at the total number of explosive movements here um, or sprints and using that data to decide on decision patterns. You better be really, really confident about your data if you're gonna be making those types of decisions. So this last part, I just wanna talk about training load really quick because I think it's a good example of how data can be put into motion and this whole thing about keeping data in context. The polar training load can go anywhere from zero to infinity. So by itself, it's just a number. The training load score for an athlete means absolutely nothing until we actually put it in context and get some information off of it. So here's some information. What it's based off of is uh, this concept of TRIMPS, which was introduced by Derek, uh, Dr. Bannister in 1975, and it's been continually researched and worked on over the years and further developed. But at a very crude standpoint, just to illustrate the concept, what is it? It's a function of total work. We're looking at heart rate response, the intensity um, multiplied out times the, the volume. So in plain English, the more time an athlete spends here in minutes in zones five and four, so the more time they spend at 80% of heart rate max or higher, the higher your training load's gonna be. The way I wrap my head around it is if we wanted a total volume load in the weight room, what would we do? We would take all the exercises, all the reps, all the weight, the total volume, multi factor that all together and end up with a single volume load, a single poundage. So this is kind of the same idea except with heart rate. And then, again, that's a very crude way of doing it. I, I just gave it arbitrarily weighting factors and said, well, you know, Zone five will be worth five points, zone four will be worth four points. It's unfair because it's not taking into consideration the athlete's makeup or the nature of the sport. So our algorithms will take into consideration these other factors here, age, gender, height, weight, resting heart rate, VO2 max, <laughs> lactate or ventilatory threshold as well. And then you can take that same concept and apply it across mechanical factors as well, where you're literally looking at the frequency distribution of distances covered at different speed zones. Just for a point of reference, speed five might start at 12 miles an hour or higher. And so you're looking at the distances accumulated across different speed zones, and same concept, you add up all the points and you end up with a mechanical load score. So you could do that with speed, distance, acceleration, deceleration numbers as well. So I put together a few slides here on training load. For sake of time, I'll give you a quick story about how some teams are, or in particular UConn, is using training load um, to help make decisions. 
At one point, Chris West up at UConn was dealing with the men's soccer coach, and the coach went up to Chris and said, you know, I'm really worried about our center midfielder's performance on the field. The last couple of weeks, he looks like he doesn't want to be there. He's exhausted. He's just not in the right place. He's always out of position. So Chris West went back and looked at two weeks, the last two weeks of training load data. And he said to the coach, he said, all right, he goes, you know, his training load score on a, on a daily basis for a game somewhere around there is about 300 points. So he gave the coach a little bit of data, a little bit of info, 300 points for a game load. Give or take a few points, whether it was overtime or whatever. But 300 points, he said, okay, so what? He goes, okay, well, this week and last week, you add it all up between the two games, so the four games over the two-week course, the four games, the weight room sessions, all the practices, that player accumulated 3,000 points in that two-week span. So from a game equivalent standpoint, what does that work out to? Played 10 games in 14 days. So all of a sudden, the light bulb went off on the co in the coach's mind, and he said, okay, is that good? I don't think that's good, is it? He goes, I don't know, right? I gave you some data. I gave you some info. We have some knowledge now. Now what we hope to develop is the wisdom. Is that good? Is that what we were aiming for? It's good to overreach, but how much overreaching, right? It all depends. You guys all know that. So that's just a quick story of how the training load point can be put into practice, how we can move it from just information to eventually knowledge and wisdom. And I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Arndt to take you through the uh, wisdom stuff. Oh, I will say one more thing. Is there a way to back up? Another thing that not just Polar, but a lot of other companies have out there are these state of readiness reports. So ultimately, what are we trying to do? We're trying to look at cumulative stress like Dr. Arndt brought up, and we have all these different things that we can consider, um, including the training load in red. In blue, you see daily activity. Certain reports will also incorporate sleep data, sleep quality, sleep duration heart rate variability, all kinds of things to use as a screening tool along the way to see which players you might need to keep an eye on. There's all kinds of other things that go into these reports, but for sake of time, I'm going to leave it there. Like Dr. Arndt said, we're at booth 406, and if you have any questions, we can take them there and at the end of the session as well. Thank you, guys. That was great. Good job. So to go back on where Dave's coming from, because now hopefully you have a, a fairly good background in terms of what these wearables can do and the type of data that we generate. And so I'm going to try to talk a little bit about how we use that, uh, both at Rutgers and with the Texas Rangers that I work with, uh, to give you an idea of, of where we apply some of these things. Because really for me, you know, <laughs> man, you can put the best plan together, right? Or you think you do. But you got to take the athletes and the coaches into account too. So that monitoring piece becomes essential. But if you don't continue to evaluate, we've got a real problem here. Assess, don't guess. We're at a point, I believe, on a sports science, uh, from a sports science aspect, where we don't have to guess as much. Now, don't get me wrong. I would be the first one, even as a scientist, to stand up here and recognize that strength and conditioning coaching, that, that, that sport coaching is both an art and a science. You have to know your athletes. I get that. All right, but we need to figure out where these two really marry, how they fit together. So how do we do this? How do we make this work with the, with the teams we work with? Um, and I got to give a lot of credit to my lab staff for this because they do a bulk of this work and they're absolutely a fantastic group. Okay, but, but we carry out testing with the teams that, that we deal with on a very regular basis. And there's a question of lab tests versus field tests. Look, as long as you're consistent in what you do, that's a big thing. That's great. That's a good start. I personally prefer lab tests if you have access to them. It's better controlled. You get more realistic numbers, we can do something with this to monitor changes. But we can assess endurance, strength, power, body composition. Uh, and, and here's the thing, when I work with athletes in particular, when I'm dealing with body composition, I'm not so much worried about percent body fat. One of the things that I really, really look at is how much muscle mass they gained, lost, or maintained throughout a season. That's what I want to know. Are you gaining or losing muscle? What's happening? Because that's going to give us an indicator of breakdown as well. So we try for frequent assessments. That allows better prescription, better program evaluation. And I'll tell you right now, and I think this is something that we finally broke through with some of the coaches that we work with, is they're like, I don't have that much time. Like, we only have X number of practices. What they very quickly learned is the time put into testing was time well spent because it saved them come practice time because it was much more efficient in terms of what they did. So it really is time well spent. We also periodize. You have to prioritize. 
man, if you're working with college athletes in particular, you can't fix everything at one time. You don't have the time with them to do it. All right, so really, you may not be able to optimally train all systems. So one of the nice things about frequent and systematic testing is that it allows you to identify where your biggest weaknesses are. Address those first. Maintain your strengths. That way, you're not wasting resources that you could be putting somewhere else. Champions are built in the off season. There's no doubt about it. You cannot wait till the season to get fit. As a matter of fact, I really worry if our athletes get more fit over the course of a season because it tells me they didn't come in the right way. I'm praying that we can just maintain them when they come in. And that's really where we've had the best success is exactly when that's been able to happen. So you have to identify those weaknesses so we can deal with those in the off season. And I'll tell you right now, for those of you that work in either hockey or baseball on the professional side, there isn't much of an off season. I mean, if you think about it, if the team makes it to the World Series, by the time they start up again with spring training, my off-season was roughly three and a half months. It's not a lot of time to fix deficiencies, especially if they're recovering from injuries. So I need to be really, really smart about how I try to do this. And then the other thing is, monitor what you're doing. Recovery is just as, or more important potentially, than the training itself. All right, especially in season. Okay, but so specificity. If you monitor what you're doing, and I think Dave was getting at this very, very well, the idea is if you have an idea of what a game looks like, you can try to simulate that in your training so that you're training the right way. You're not wasting your time doing things that are gonna have no real application to the sport itself. So when we look at this, and you look at training stress, okay, and let's just deal with that. We won't even deal with the other stress outside of here. Realistically, if you're talking about accounting for all of it, the time in practice in games is about 80%. That means as a strength coach, you've got about 20% of that total training stress that you have time to apply. All right, your preparation to train, the time in the weight room, the conditioning aspect and stuff like that. So here's the thing. If the only ones using the data are the strength coaches, and I make, let's say, a 20% change in how I'm training my athletes, if I just change 20% of the 20% of the time I have, I only made a 4% change in their overall training. That means you have to have the sport coach on board because they're gonna have to modify how they change practice and games as well. And when we get to some biomarker stuff, I'll give you an example of exactly how this can work and work really well if the coach works with you to do this. So, what we're trying to do is provide knowledge. We want context. And Dave was getting this with this idea of knowledge and wisdom. Without context, data are just numbers. I need to understand my athletes. I need to know the demands of the sport. I need to know what competitions are coming up. I want to peak for the right things. I don't want to peak for a team that we should beat. I want to peak for a team we need to beat. All right, so that becomes a really important consideration. The other thing too is you have to recognize when the greatest training stress is incurred. Two ways, one, games, all right? I can't simulate that in the lab, I can't simulate competition. We actually just finished a caffeine study and we designed a, a soccer protocol for the treadmill. We actually had to up the GPS speeds that corresponded from our game data because we can't simulate the competitive aspect of a game. So to maximize training load, we still have to move that. The other thing too is, where's the other big training stress? Preseason. I'll tell you right now, how many of you work with fall sports in college? Show of hands. It's barbaric. It's the dumbest thing I've ever seen. The NCAA screws these athletes. You got about two weeks. Two weeks ain't a preseason, two weeks is a warm up. You got to start that way earlier. So what happens is the coach goes, oh my God, we got all these freshmen coming in. I got to get on the ball. We're training two, three times a day. We'll get it. Well, here's the thing. And I'll show you some data to support this. Your greatest training stress occurs in preseason. And what we're finding with our athletes is many of them never fully recover from it because now you're in the bulk of your competition. Oops. All right, so we've gotta be smart about this. We also have to identify coach controllables versus player controllables. <laughs> if you've got this data, right, and you're looking at it and you're going, okay, so our training stress is this. It's not up to the athlete whether they practice or not. It's not up to them how they structure practice. That's a coach controllable. However, the athlete's in charge of their sleep, in charge of their nutrition. Both of them can help with hydration and nutrition. So identifying the controllables and how we can do this. One of the things that I really try to stress to my graduate students is this concept of see, say, do. When you're looking at data, all right, and this will become really relevant when we talk about biomarkers. First question you have to ask is, do I see it change? 
If you don't see it change, or it changes too easily, it's not going to be much use. It's not really telling you anything. So let's say we see it change. Next question is, what would you say about it? So if it changes, why? How would you explain it to a coach? How would you explain it to the athlete? So there's the see and the say. The third thing is do. What would you do about it? Because the thing is, if you can't fix it, if there's nothing you could change to modify it, don't waste your time with it. See, say, do. It's three simple guides to get us to what's usable data. The other thing we have to start doing is accounting for overall stress. My background is exercise endocrinology. That's what my PhD is in. So overall stress is a big deal to me. All right, actually, most of my work's in the HPA axis, so I deal a lot with cortisol. All right? Stress is a really important consideration, and to me, it's the missing piece of the puzzle. It's not just about the training stress. It's about what happens after that to help recover from the training stress and what other stresses you have going on. So it's not just about training and games, and we have to start realizing this. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the methods that we have to try to do this. And I will say with what Polar is trying to do and some others, in terms of at least trying to monitor sleep and things like that, it, it, it's helping. It's giving us a recovery index. I will tell you right now, though, if you work with any tools that give you a recovery index, do not trust them especially daily wearables, unless your athlete wore them every day, 24-7. If it's an accumulated stress and they miss a day or they miss a few hours, your numbers are off. Be smart about it. Use it in the context of developing your own recovery index. The other thing we have to do is we have to account for individual factors. What was the fitness of your athletes, especially particular athletes? What's their injury history? What are they coming off of? All right, what's something that we have to address in terms of maybe an injury history with the team as well? Just to give you an idea of how we use this, you know, and, and Dave talked a lot about training load. And honestly, early on, we used that a lot with our teams. But then we quickly realized, you know, the coaches were getting pretty good at controlling it. They could account for training load really well, and yet we're still not seeing all the performance we want to see, what's going on. So when we start to look at this, to give you an idea, one of the things that we love the data output for is to educate the athletes. If any of you, how many of you in here work with female athletes? Okay. How many of you think you'd have a challenge telling them they need to eat 4,000 calories a day? Okay. So here's where data become useful. These are female soccer players, Rutgers players. One of our center backs in a game, double overtime, which we had seven of last year, Unbelievable study, by the way. I couldn't even create that if I wanted to. All right, 2,500 calories in a game. That's just the game. And we wonder why they break down. And so we have to figure out when we show them this, and you're, if you tell them, you need to get like three, three, 4,000 calories a day, oh my God, I'll get fat. You burn 2,500. Oh, okay. All right, so I probably need to eat more. All right, it's a great educational tool. All right, we can look at sprints, we can look at heart rate and things like that. And so we can track this over the course of a game. What we've started at, and, and I want to stress this, this part's really important. What I'm going to talk about are the use of biomarkers for a little bit, all right, and how we track internal responses. These will be useless if you don't have a good foundation with tracking your training load, because otherwise you'll have no relative context to give you an idea of what you can modify, all right? So what we started out with is the cake. It was training load. It was the polar heart rate monitors and GPS. Then we add in a next layer, and for us that was the biomarkers. And if you ask any of our coaches on the women's staff, they'll admit that the monitoring got us perennially into the top 20 and 15. The biomarkers got us into the final four. It was that last little piece, but we couldn't have done that if we didn't have the other stuff sorted out. So what do you do then? Where are the sprinkles coming from? That's some of the other things now that we'll talk about when it comes to sleep and recovery as well. But what we did is, and actually one of my doctoral students just presented on this earlier today, so thank God I'm not stealing his thunder on this one. All right, but the preseason training elicits your highest energy. When I look at total distance covered, this is four weeks. So the first two weeks of preseason and the first two weeks of the season. Total distance covered, if I accumulate this, declines over the course of the season. So our biggest load is here in the preseason and early in the season. Here's our case cows expended over those same four weeks, and then it declines and reaches a plateau. Then we look at training load accumulation, same idea. And by the way, these are males and females, so we also work with our men's team. So what I'm going to show you next is, is one example of why in, on, on the exercise physiology side, we cannot take what we learn about male athletes and apply it to female athletes. Because you know what? They're different. <laughs> a lot of ways, right? Kindergarten cop. Boys have a penis, girls have a vagina. So what we're dealing with, 
So if we look at cortisol, for example, and we go from time one to time two, so these are four weeks apart from baseline at preseason, four weeks in, what we see is that, especially on our women's side, we get a tremendous rise in free cortisol. Total cortisol, and by the way, both of these are above average values. These are above norms, and they maintain this all season long. Our men don't change as much, but still, even by, it takes them all the way to the end of the season to be back at their baseline value. We really did some damage here. We see it with total cortisol, and we see it with creatine kinase as well. And our men, partly because of the way the game's played, have even a little, bit or, a little bigger breakdown when we look at it in terms of muscle damage. What was really interesting for us that, that these tools allow us to look at is what became remarkable on our women's side, four weeks in, we had a dramatic decline in iron. This was statistically significant, okay? We started supplementation with them. It still took all the way to the end of the season before we brought it back up. So we actually had four players that were diagnosed with exercise-induced anemia. We wouldn't have caught that if it wasn't for this. So now the monitoring becomes useful. All right, and so when we look at our other markers that go along with this, we see the same thing. When we start looking at growth hormone, <laughs> growth hormone response early on was really good because we needed to handle the demands of training. And then the body starts to go, ooh, what are you doing to me? And so it hit a flat plateau here. What's interesting is we had a much different growth hormone profile than we did in the females, that's the black line, than we did with the males. Same thing with IGF-1, with total testosterone. What's interesting here is in the males, for total testosterone, it actually goes below baseline by the time we hit the end of the season. I know it's hard to tell because the scale is so different or so big in order to fit males and females on here with testosterone. But again, we're seeing these effects. So <laughs> I'll give you an example of how we use this. And I'm gonna come back to this here in a second. All right, as a matter of fact, let me go back here. How can you use this? Where does context come in? Last season, as we're tracking all the players, we had two players in particular whose training loads were high, but not dramatically. So they were right around that 1,200 point value that Dave was talking about. And, and the way I look at that 1,200 points is like a bank account. All right, you got roughly that amount to work within a week. You try not to get overdrawn. So it depends on where you pull it from. Do you want it from games or do you want it from training? Or a mixture of both. So what was happening, though, is the players, when we started to look at their sprints and their top speeds, were not producing the same. And by the way, both of these were attackers, pretty critical players. Then we got their blood work back. We noticed both of them declined in testosterone, both of them had a drop in growth hormone, and both of them had a dramatic rise in cortisol. So the call goes to the coach, and I said, hey, Mike, so here's the thing, and this is where context is so important. Look, <clears throat> so we got these two players. I know they need to play. All right, I played, I played at UVA. I wanna play, I'd love to play. I don't wanna sit, but I know we need them. So I said, here's the deal. If we can keep them in the games, are you willing to not have them practice? Now I wanna, th for, for some of you, think about how hard that would be to, for a coach to be like, you gotta be kidding me, not practice. He goes, and this is the trust we've built over the years, because I will say that this is important to the story. We have not had a single season-ending injury in three seasons. Not one. When we started working with the team, they had five times the national average in ACL injuries. No season-ending injuries. If you can keep them healthy and keep them on the field, you can produce. So anyway, Mike goes, um, okay, seems fair. We'll have a conversation with the players, explain why. Both of them over the next two weekends scored multiple goals apiece. The next call I got back from the coach was, so um, how many more players do we need to sit? <laughs> no, <laughs> and so you're like, we've come a long way, this is good. But the reason is you can't just take these data and you see a, a little fluctuation or a little anomaly and go right to the coach and go, they need to rest. Nah, wait, watch what happens, watch for patterns. Don't freak out, or look. don't become chicken little, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. Because then when something really important comes up, the coach tunes you out. So you have to be able to put it into context in order for this to work. Now, the other thing that we found that was a bit interesting and a bit surprising, because here's the thing, when we did this one study, we we're thinking, okay, I'm guessing that fitness should predict biomarker responses as well as training load. Only thing is it turned out it was a little different than we thought. This is why we do research. What we hit on was what we're calling a fit athlete paradox. The players with the higher fitness levels coming into preseason, higher VO2 max, lower percent body fat, actually had more perturbation in biomarkers, not less, just in preseason. What it turns out is happening is because they're more fit, guess who's doing most of the work in preseason? 
the fit players. We're so worried about the unfit players. Don't overreach them. Don't break them down too much. We've got to bring them up to level. The problem is then the fit players are doing all the work. And sure enough, their workload was higher than the unfit players. And it was a significant predictor in this case. As a matter of fact, it predicted more than 50% of the biomarker response. So when we start to look at this, the more fit athletes are capable of performing more work. That ability to perform more work, coupled with high volume, short rest, recovery time of preseason training, puts the fit athlete at the greater risk for overreaching. What was interesting is that was two seasons ago, brought the coaches' attention to what was happening. So actually with the more fit players, they gave them more time off during preseason this year. That relationship went away. Now they were the same as everybody else. Again, using knowledge to develop wisdom in terms of how you structure this. So what's moving the needle then? What's really causing these changes for us? Well, ultimately, what we decided to do is take our training load variables and see whether or not they were predicting our changes in biomarkers. Is that where it's coming from? Well, it turns out that the, the heart rate, total distance covered, number of sprints, the KCALs expended, all of those were significant predictors of creatine kinase, total cortisol, estradiol, free testosterone, as much as 25% of the variance in some cases. So training load is certainly impacting this, but I look at this a different way too. That also means that roughly 75% of the variance is being accounted by something else. So there's more to this story. So again, we're monitoring our two or three hours of training, but what about the other 22, the other 21? All right, what's happening there? And so this allows us to step back and go, okay, there's more to this stress story than just what's happening in practice and games. There's a lot more to it. So what do we do next? Well, first question is, how simple can we get? Because I hear a lot of coaches and schools, oh, I don't have the money for that. I get it. Biomarker testing, because we do research. We have a lot of access to things that a lot of teams might not. I, I'm fine with that. I get that. All right, even the heart rate systems for a lot of teams ah, come from a small school. It's a lot of money. So the question becomes, okay, what else can we do? Well, we can do sleep questionnaires. All right, what we're finding is we actually did sleep questionnaires this year, and we actually found that quality of sleep was a better predictor of the biomarker responses than quantity of sleep. All right, unless they're sleeping better, just sleeping more doesn't always get at it. Mood. What about mood skills? We hear this all the time, right? And actually, it's funny. My master's was in sports psychology. And you look at it and you go, we've always been taught that mood, all right, fatigue, depression, those are the best predictors of overreaching. Well, maybe not. Because if I skip down a little bit, if we talk about what comes first, the chicken or the egg, what's happening is now that we have a more systematic way of measuring these things, we actually found that the biomarkers, their changes, came before the mood changes, which came before performance. So mood's still coming up before performance does, but actually the biomarkers driving this. And what was really cool is we saw a change in tryptophan in particular. Tryptophan's your precursor for serotonin. Turns out it wound up being tied to depression. All right, so when we're starting to see this with the athletes and these mood changes, that becomes, the other problem too is for both mood and rating of perceived exertion. I know there was a paper that just came out on this. Here's the problem with these. They're good, but they're not great, and here's why. <laughs> Athletes lie. All right, these are subjective, and here's the thing. If an athlete thinks their playing status might be affected, you're like, how are you feeling today? Great. I feel like garbage. The other thing, too, is you know a lot of athletes don't actually understand that, that their normal is not always good. It's not optimal. That's just how they're used to feeling. I feel tired. And then you train them. We eat. We feed them better. They sleep better, and they go, God, I feel good. Like, how'd you feel before? Well, apparently crappy. And they don't even know. So yeah, these can be useful if you don't have a lot to rely on, but realize you're gonna have to take them with a bit of a grain of salt. There's one professional boxer we work with and his motto is chase the pain. So I remember the first time we're doing a VO2 max test with him. All right, level one, all right, stage one. What's your RP? Six. Remember this is six to 20, okay. Level two, what's your RP? Six. Three, six. And you're like, oh, dude. He's like, he won't admit that it's hard because he doesn't want to ever admit that in a fight. All right, so we have to recognize this as well. The other thing, too, is one performance test we've hit on that actually is pretty good is vertical jump. Okay, and we actually found that the biomarker changes did predict changes in vertical jump. UConn's done some neat work with this, and thanks to Chris West for sharing this with me, but they actually found that vertical jump Two days out from a match, the changes compared to baseline predicted top running speed in that game. 
So there is a tie to performance here, and this is pretty quick and easy. We can test a whole team in less than 10 minutes if we want to do this. Do it weekly, bi-weekly, whatever works. So what comes first, the chicken and the egg? Again, lining these up and getting at the earliest indication of training status is one of the best things we can do. But the wild card in interpretation is the athlete themselves. We have to start paying better attention to that. So from the lab to the field, look, we've heard this about hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. And I agree. But I think we could be a little bit better with this. Because in my opinion, smart work beats talent when talent doesn't work smart. Now, if you put hard work and smart work together, and you've got the talent, you're dangerous. Now you're an elite company. And I think that's cool. It's not magic science. I had a coach tell me one time, I can tell if they're fit. What are you, freaking Harry Potter? You got a crystal ball? That's awesome. Congratulations. I don't think so. Because then they get the results back for the players. Oh, I didn't know that they were, this. you know, like, oh, okay, there you go. These are tools. Choose the right one for the job. You know, you don't pick a hammer to drive in a screw. Use the right tools for the questions you're asking and for what your expertise is. And I would say use the right people to help do this too. This is where we're trying to develop the knowledge. We're trying to make this usable. It's not just plug and play. You have to take it in context. And by all means, please, for the love of God, avoid data diarrhea. Just because you can use it doesn't mean you should. I remember I was at a talk here at NSC a couple years ago, there was a presentation on Australian rules football, and they were looking at GPS data. And I kid you not, three slides apart. First slide was best predictor of performance was time spent in high speed running. Three slides later, best predictor of injury was time spent in high speed running. And they didn't draw the parallel. So your best predictor of performance was also your best predictor of injury. That's just data for data's sake. That's not putting it into context. So we need to start looking at how this is. Just because the test is out there or the tool is out there doesn't mean you have to use it. Unplug a bit, okay? Use what's useful, get simple, all right? And I will say this, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing well. But I'm gonna give you a little caveat to that. If it's not worth doing well, it's not worth doing. Either do it right or don't do it. But if you half it, you're gonna get half results. Okay, and, and that's the thing with any teams we work with, that's the message is either buy in or don't. Don't go somewhere in between because that's just going to create problems when all is said and done. So I try to apply the Goldilocks principle to everything we do, all right? <laughs> this applies to training and this applies to monitoring. You can have too much, the porridge is a little too hot. Porridge is a little too cold. You're not doing enough. Ideally, we're finding that just right somewhere in the middle that allows us to draw conclusions, not overextend ourselves, and understand that data are a tool. These assessments are tools. Put the right ones in your toolbox and pull from them when it makes the most sense. With that, I want to thank all of you for paying attention. I really appreciate you guys being here on the first day. Thank you very much. We'll be happy to take a couple questions if you have them.